Australia belongs to China. Hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead. These are some famous words from Deng Xiaoping. And they basically mean don't ever show your full hand of cards and don't let anyone know you have an ace up your sleeve. And this philosophy is something that he put into place when he opened China up. For those of you who don't know Deng Xiaoping very, very briefly, he's the guy who changed China from a very poor, destitute, starving nation with many troubles into what it is today, which is a thriving economy and you know a, a nation that's been on the up and up forever and ever. And the way he did this was to open China up to foreign investment by you know, saying, hey, rest of the world, you can come and set up your factories here in China. You can come and invest in China. And he set up these special economic zones like Shenzhen and Zhuhai, etc. Um, no need for a history lesson here. All you need to know is that he made a lot of good positive changes to China. But he was also the guy in charge when the Tiananmen Square massacre happened. Anyway, this idea of biding your time and hiding your strength has been very, very effective when it comes to Australia. Hi, Winston. I've been following you and Seamilk for a few years and appreciate your honest appraisal of life in China. I live in Sydney, Australia, and your recent video really struck a chord with me. Where to start? This is a difficult topic to address as the line between what's xenophobic and what is genuine criticism of the Chinese government is often muddied. I guess that's part of the problem. Three times a week, I receive a voicemail on my phone in Mandarin. Friends translate for me, and I've learned that the messages range from extortion attempts to you better vote for this guy in the upcoming election. I've watched Australia evolve to a point that I no longer recognize. Our housing market is dominated by Chinese buyers who are not Australian citizens, but manage to purchase large numbers of apartments and houses. This has caused the market in all capitals to jump to a point where the average Australian can't buy a house. The Australian government is so reliant on trade that they're selling Australia out. Major infrastructure is usually carried out by Chinese companies and Chinese property developers are purchasing large portions of land. Politicians with Chinese heritage have recently had links to the Chinese government proven, but still nothing changes. 90% of international students are from China, which in turn creates an us versus them mentality. The beautiful multicultural environment which Australia once was is no longer. My nephew recently reported that he was studying Confucius as part of the state approved syllabus. My concerns is that Australia is too reliant on China. The warning signs are there, but I worry that without proper conversation, China's influence in Australia is only going to help China. The last thing I want is for this to read like the rantings of a madman. Everything I've documented can be found with one Google search. So as you can see from that letter, my subscriber is incredibly worried about the influence China has and how it's actually changed his way of life. This is something I've received from different people. I've got comments about this. I've gotten various emails. I've had some Skype meetings of people who are very upset. Uh, one guy had a long Skype meeting with me the other day and told me how him and his wife were bidding for a house that they were going to buy in Adelaide. And what happened was they went in there with, uh, you know, to the real estate agent and all that, and they were getting a loan from the bank. So they were busy doing the paperwork to apply for the loan. And while they were busy trying to get their loan papers in order, a Chinese customer came in and said, hey, I want the house, I'll pay cash. And of course, it was sold to the Chinese um, client because it's cash up front, it's money right there and uh, the seller wouldn't have to wait for the loan papers to go through, etc., etc. This has, of course, led to quite a lot of animosity from local Australian people towards the Chinese di diaspora, which has you know, been seen for a long time as encroaching on the Australian way of life, changing the way neighborhoods look, changing the way people are allowed to talk in school, um, and basically just changing the political landscape too. I'd like to talk about this, but we have to be firm and we have to be fair. I do not want in any way, shape or form for my videos to ever spark hatred towards any specific group. What we have to understand here is it's not the Chinese diaspora, but it's the CCP and it's United Front, what's it called? United Front Work Department, something like that. We'll just call it the United Front from now on. And that is its propaganda arm. You know, it's international foreign propaganda arm, which 
is tasked with going in and infiltrating different institutes overseas. It's not just one department, by the way. It's a whole lot of different institutions working together in order to basically sway opinion, push soft power, make sure that anything that the CCP doesn't like isn't said on TV or in public or, you know, you don't have demonstrations. And they do this through various different means. We'll discuss a couple of them in a minute. But um, it's these people that are basically using the Chinese citizens abroad in order to, well, for their own gains, really, in order to push this, this CCP Communist Party narrative. And this narrative is something that we must be aware of because the Western world is massively unprepared when it comes to dealing with the underhanded methods of influence and interference the CCP has and uses. Like I said, especially through its citizens abroad. The thing about this propaganda is that it has a built-in failsafe, and that is the education of your average Chinese person. You see, myself having taught kindergartners, middle schoolers, high schoolers, adults, business, doctors, huge range of different people from different walks of life in China. I have seen it in all of the different stages of education in China. There is a narrative that the Western world is out to bully China, is out to make fun of China, is out to um, sabotage China's plans of being great. You know, it's the Western world keeping China down. And they say, you know, Taman Chifu woman, Taman Ma woman. That's the idea is that the West, you know, and they keep harking back to the opium wars and and that sort of thing it's this idea of us versus them that the west is here to keep us down and it works incredibly well so once you've basically educated someone to believe that's the case and then you tell them to go and you know if there's a university teacher out there who says taiwan is independent or taiwan is a, is a country for instance the university students can get all enraged and say that's not true there's only one china etc and then what happens is when they get pushback from anyone who says, listen, man, people should be able to have, you know, their own opinions and form their own opinions and they can believe what they want. Immediately, that upbringing about the Western world trying to interfere with China, the Western world trying to keep China down, kicks in. And what it does is it solidifies this propaganda. It actually makes, it doesn't change minds, it makes these students and, you know, these various other people that are most of the time unwittingly participating in this uh, ridiculous propaganda, it, it makes them feel as if the government was right. And they very often go back to China even more nationalist than when they left to go and study. You know, it's incredibly effective. It's kind of like a, a par some parents telling their children, listen, you're going to go to school, but everyone in the school hates our family. So they're going to bully you and they're going to make fun of you. So the child goes to school and someone says, hey, you know, your parents, I read in the news that your parents are running a meth lab and they were arrested for child trafficking and all that stuff, actual facts. And then um, the child will say, yeah, my parents are right. Everyone is out to bully me. And they'll go home and say, yeah, you see, you were right. Everyone bullied me. They obviously hate us for no reason. Meanwhile, the parents are actually, you know, running a meth lab and trafficking children. That's my analogy for this video. Uh, let's move on. So let's talk about some of these methods so that you can be aware of them. So I'm not going to sit here and make speculation and, you know, educated guesses, which of course I can. But I want to look at facts, things that have actually been proven, where you can do a Google search and find out all the information. There are tons of articles out there. So let's see. Let's start out with the fact that we've got PLA scientists researching at Australian universities. Um, and actually being funded by Australian taxpayers in some cases. This is something that has happened. And you have to realize just how dangerous that can be for you know the Western world security-wise. Some of the things that they were working on researching uh, are military things, you know, military technology and so on. And these are actually officers in the PLA. You know, they belong to the army and they're part of the CCP. So they're studying and being funded by the Australian government so they can take that knowledge back to be used in China. It's not a very good thing. It's uh, pretty bad. It's pretty damning. Things like economic blackmail. I am reading from a list, by the way. There's a lot of things here. Um, persuasion, interference, and coercion through money. We've got actual cases of wealthy donors giving money to politicians. There's quite a few in Australia that have been caught out. Uh, we've got um, for forever this united front has been targeting the diasporas 
in places like Australia. But now they're moving beyond that. They're trying to target the mainstream as well. Uh, and that's why it's all of a sudden becoming more um, recognizable because beforehand, the language barrier has always been a kind of a, a way for them to escape scrutiny. And what you've had in Australia is you've had, you know, the, the CCP, uh, well, at least organizations or individuals tied to the CCP buying up all the Chinese language media, so newspapers, radio stations, things like that. And then, of course, changing the narrative and uh, making sure that they never publish anything that goes against the CCP and at the same time sort of putting out all the propaganda to the Chinese diaspora. So all of those Chinese language newspapers, in fact, it's 90% uh, of all Chinese language media in Australia is CCP controlled. Um, or linked to the CCP. Uh, what you also be, what you're finding, and of course, we've discussed this kind of thing in depth on our podcasts, which is something I suggest you do watch when you're done here. Um, you have different organizations acting on behalf of the CCP, you know, student associations, things like that. They basically get a direction or directive, and this has been proven, so I'm not just talking, you know, nonsense. I'm not pulling this out of the air. They get a directive from the... Uh, the consulate, the PRC consulate, to like, hey, there's going to be a pro-Tibetan march or there's going to be a free Hong Kong thing. Just go there and make sure that you disrupt it or, you know, try your best to sabotage it, you know, in whichever way you can. Um, that's happened quite a lot. Uh, there have been tons of cases and reports of during the elections that the Chinese diaspora is getting phone calls and, uh, you know, if they don't want a certain person to be in power, they'll basically just spread a bunch of nonsense saying this person is anti-China. You know, so don't vote for them. And that works very well. You know, if you look at my videos, uh, I started to get horribly attacked when certain people started to say, oh, look, he's anti-China, even when I wasn't, when I was incredibly pro-China. It's just somebody has to say, this foreign is anti-China. And because a lot of Chinese people living overseas and in China, of course, can't understand English. So if they watch my video, they don't know what I'm saying. But because someone said that I'm anti-China, they will immediately dislike me and go and attack me. And that's very very uh, effective what else do we have here um, you know things like uh, the university is bowing to pressure because there is so much money coming in from the Chinese international students that if a professor says something that um, you know along the lines of hey Taiwan is a is is a independent country like I said or, or anything starts to talk about the the Uyghurs being um, persecuted they'll kind of get a little nudge from the management saying, hey, listen, you know, it's, it's rather don't say that, you know, and the people are self-censoring, etc. There have been quite a few cases of professors and so on getting, you know, pressured not to say certain things. That's also very, it's out there in the news. You can go read, read it. We also have this uh, situation of uh, business being used as a weapon where, um, you know, Chinese businesses will basically threaten to cut off supply or cut off orders or things like that if certain people say certain things so it's kind of uh, it's fairly subtle in some terms but in other terms not anyway look this is a very long list that i've got here uh, i could keep, keep reading but just to give you an idea of kind of what's been going on at the end of the day we have to acknowledge what's going on here we can't just keep turning a blind eye we can't be, keep self-censoring for the fear of being called racist or discriminatory and also, just because we have, you know, very pleasant and nice Chinese friends, in my case, very nice, wonderful Chinese family, I can't self-censor myself. When I see the CCP doing bad things, when I see the CCP trying to influence what people think, you know, in a ridiculous manner, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to talk about it. I've been doing it for a while now, and you're going to see me doing it even more and more loudly in the future. However... We should not take out our frustrations on a group of people. Like I said, when it comes to the Chinese diaspora, a lot of the people that have moved out of China have moved out because they don't like it there. Or they've gone for, you know, better, greener pastures or whatever the case. And a lot of the Chinese diaspora are fantastic, wonderful, caring people exactly the same as you and me. It's the bad apples in between them that really give everyone else a bad name. But we have to be alert and we have to know how to identify these bad apples and these meddlers and these people that are out to change your opinions um, and force, I should say, force your opinions to change through 
harassment campaigns, through threatening to get people fired, through harassing and uh, threatening your family and things like that. Um, so let's keep an eye out for these things. And uh, as always, just like the awesome Chinese friends I have and the awesome Chinese family I have, I would like all of you out there to stay awesome. Don't forget, next Friday, just in time for a beer, you can catch another Serpent ZA. On Wednesday, we've got Seamilk. You know, Lao86, go check him out. He's fun, he's interesting, he's got some different insights into China than I do. Um, most importantly, though, Monday, we've got ADV China. And if you want to learn more about soft power and what the Chinese Communist Party is up to around the world trying to influence people, you should really check out our podcast which you can find every second Thursday. Links all up here and in the description.